Good morning, my friend, and welcome to our very own Top 40 Time Machine as we hop back to a time when Peter Davison was the doctor, Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister, Wally Lewis was the King, and David Bowie was still God, although by then that was an increasingly tenuous proposition. This week we sack and plunder the Radio 10 Top 45 for its 10 finest jewels from January 16th, 1984, in this week's edition of The Past is a Foreign Country. Checking in at number 10, down from a high of 8 the previous week, is Public Image Limited with This Is Not A Love Song. The song did a lot better in my hometown than in the rest of the country where it but briefly headbutted the top 20. I saw them touring at the end of the year at a pub called the Mansfield Tavern, which in those days was just about on the edge of the civilised world, and has since then been consumed by the civilised world and demolished. They were the loudest thing I have ever heard and may well still be the loudest thing I've ever heard. Not that I've ever heard too much quite as clearly after I heard them. I do recall this was the final song of a rather long encore right after a very begrudging version of Anarchy in the UK. Number 9 is a song I have no recollection of whatsoever but it's rather great. Why Me by Irene Cara. Up from number 11 last week to its peak of number 9 this, if I had to do a three word review of this tune it would be 1984. It is the most 1984 sounding record ever. At number 8 is possibly the second most 1984 sounding record ever, Twist of Fate by Olivia Newton-John. Up from number 10 the week before, this spirited dance rocker was one of Livy's final big hits as she managed only two more of her 19 solo top 40 entries after this. Time was all but up for Twist of Fate as well as the bottom dropped out and fell to number 17 the next week. Number 7 is one of the best one hit wonders of the 80s, Big Country with their epic in a big country. Odd thing about this one is that it charted in the rest of the nation eight months before it kicked off in my hometown. A band that wore their Boss CE2 chorus pedals like a badge of honour. Perhaps only Robert Smith of The Cure has been a more devoted fan of this particular stomp box. The band's cleverly layered twin guitar attack and huge drum sound should have gone on to much greater things, but for some reason, people went for their pale inferiors, U2. Number 6 was a band on the cusp of superstardom in excess, whose original sin tumbled down from number 4 the week before. Although the band had gathered much momentum in Australia with their sleek Shabu Shabar album in 1983, which was, by the way, the first Australian album to be issued on CD, it wasn't until Nile Rogers stripped down their sound and made it less rock and more angular and danceable that they had their worldwide breakthrough with April 1984's The Swing. Original Sin made number three nationwide and started an upward arc that would last three great albums. The Swing, Listen Like Thieves and X, until external pressures and factors irretrievably dispersed the band's energy. Some fine, fun and funky facts before we plunge into the top five. This week's boon single was the pretty nifty Computer One by Dear Enemy, up 15 places to number 19, while the big faller was the Venetians with Chinese Eyes, down 20 spots to number 41. The Radio 10 chart was the only chart in the country that registered that record, otherwise it got to number 63 nationwide. The longest residing records in the countdown were the wondrous Karma Chameleon by Culture Club and amazingly the appalling Bop Girl by Pat Wilson, which had both been hanging in for 17 weeks. X number ones making their way out of the charts were Red Red Wine by UB40 and Karma Chameleon, both of which spent three weeks at the pinnacle, and the lone weaker Semantics by the mighty Australian Crawl. The most interesting debutante this week was Susie and the Banshee's excellent version of Dear Prudence, which came in at 42, rose 26 places the next week, and then fell 14. According to David Kent's extensive and long-running all-time Australian charts algorithm, our entry at number 5 is the 12th biggest hit ever on our local charts, Islands in the Stream by Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton. Finally hitting number one on the 27th of February, it stayed in the top 40 for six months, finally dropping off in late May. The song of course was written by local talent Bee Gees, 
they originally wanted to give it to Marvin Gaye. A song that will forever be a staple of wedding receptions, karaoke nights and oldies radio, it represents classicist pop at its finest. Down through a peak of three last week, number four belonged to Melbourne band Pseudo Echo with their fantastic debut single, Listening. The supreme exponents of Australian synth pop, Listening was the first of eight top 40 entries, including five top 20s and one number one. Pseudo Echo are still a great drawer on the festival circuit, always throw on a slamming show, and there are a few things as gratifying as taking your kids to see a band you used to see when you were their age and having them be as blown away as you were by the undiminished power and sense of joy that a band can still project after all of these years. Few artists have had their careers fluctuate as wildly between highs and lows as Paul McCartney. In the 70s and 80s, McCartney managed a mere 10 top 10 hits in Australia and only 7 of them were either solo or with wings. And when you consider those hits contain the likes of Another Day, Ebony and Ivory, and this week's number three, Say, 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 it's hardly a compelling document on behalf of a guy who used to be the best Beatle. By the way, an even more shocking stat is that over the same period, Fleetwood Mac, seemingly unfailing hitmakers they were at AM radio dominators of some standing, had only one top ten hit. Say, 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 while by some distance the best of the egregious three, isn't a Paul McCartney record. He's hardly on it, and when he is, he sounds distinctly uncomfortable. One suspects his presence on the record is for much the same reason as Michael Jackson married Lisa Marie Presley. It's simply band affiliation and co-option by Jackson. Jackson, who, by the way, is at the peak of his powers here, reminding us that from apart and above all of the things that we perceive him to be, he was undeniably a glorious singer. It's a weak McCartney record, a middling Jackson one, and a poor blend of the two. Hanging in at number two this week, having dropped down from two weeks at number one, is Billy Joel's charming pastiche Uptown Girl. Is there anyone in the world who doesn't like this song? Seriously? The difference between this record and McCartney's is that Joel is connected to the music. It belongs to him, whereas McCartney is just wearing a musical costume. Their respective videos are object lessons in how to use the now fully formed medium to communicate a song. Say 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 with its parallel narrative that makes little sense, and Uptown Girl where the music is integrated into the video, not directly driving, but colouring the narrative. But we're not here to talk about videos, we're here to talk about pop-tastic platters. And there are a few more deserving number ones in the 1980s than Billy Joel's only number one, Uptown Girl. And speaking of number one... Lionel Richie spends his second week at the top with All Night Long. At the risk of being run out of town by a mob, this record annoys me by not being quite awful enough to complain about and not especially interesting enough to write anything about. Suffice to say, it's no brick house, but back in the day it was unavoidable, especially at house parties. This was its last week at the apex to be deposed by Thriller, which left 11 places to claim gold. Thriller did this in spite of its eponymous album coming out 15 months ago and with seven hit singles already in its wake. All Night Long spent another two weeks at number two and finally dropped off the charts after four and a half months in early April. It was a slight record, but not one you turned the radio over for when it came on. A fascinating collection from what was, to my mind, the fin de siècle of classic pop. 1985 was the God of Damodong. From the purposely confrontational This Is Not A Love Song to the straightforward pop of Islands in the Stream. From the retro stylings of Uptown Girl to the remorseless modernism of Original Sin. From the sloppy and obvious Say 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 to the bold and next-gen big country. You don't get that kind of diversity in the top 40 anymore. And that big shrink started to occur in the last half of the 80s. The super secret scoring algorithm returns a respectable score of 6.3 out of 10 for this week's effort. Where were you in 1984? Who were you in 1984? Were you even in 1984? Does any of this music or these acts still resonate with you today? Check out the playlist, leave a comment, even like or subscribe. Whatever way the deal goes down. 
We'll chat next week in the next instalment of The Past is a Foreign Country. <laughs>